Prabhupada used to say, does anyone wake up in the morning and ask for distress? No one does. But distress comes. So similarly, when you wake up in the morning, whether you ask for happiness or not, happiness will come if it's meant to come to you, material happiness. And therefore, this is the teaching that Krishna actually gives again and again and again in the Bhagavad Gita. You know the first instruction, real spiritual instruction that Krishna gives to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita? Okay, that's, that's instruction, oh, that's some knowledge he gives. But even before that, he says something else to Arjun. He gives the instruction, even before that. You are not the body. You are not the body, that's knowledge, but still an instruction he gives to Arjun. Very important instruction. When he talks about the seasons. Learn to tolerate. Tolerate. This is really, if you look at the Gita, the first real instruction that Krishna gives to Arjuna in the Gita. Learn to tolerate. Dira statra na muyati. One who learns to tolerate, na muyati, he'll never be bewildered. If you learn to tolerate, you'll never be bewildered. If you don't know how to tolerate, you'll always be bewildered. The Sanskrit word for bewildered is muyanti. It comes from the Sanskrit word moha. Moha means illusion. So muyanti means one who is illusion or one who is bewildered. This is dhira statra If you are dhira, if you learn to tolerate, you'll never be bewildered. So when there are bad times, tolerate. And when there are good times, also tolerate. That's interesting. You ever think, would you ever tell someone, tolerate happiness? <laughs> Who would tolerate happiness? Happiness is good. What do you mean, tolerate happiness? Why do you have to tolerate happiness? Okay, distress I understand, tolerate it. Why do you have to tolerate happiness? Because Krishna says, happiness, within happiness is the seed of distress. When you get some happiness in this material world, know that in that happiness you're getting is the seed of distress. Krishna says it in, a, in another way in the fifth chapter, he says, Ye hisham sparasha jaboga, dukha yonaya eva te. That sukha, material happiness, is the dukha yoni. Anyone know what the word yoni means? Womb. 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 Sukha is the dukha yoni. Material happiness is the womb of distress. So like say there's a woman and she's pregnant, within her womb is the child. You know? So now imagine there's material happiness, which is like in this analogy the woman, and in the woman's womb is distress. So what does that mean? Ultimately a child will be born. So after some time, the material happiness, which in its womb has distress, will give birth to distress. So it's, it's a setup. We think we're enjoying, but that very enjoyment is the womb of distress. You know, like, do they play golf here in Denmark? Golf? Some people do. Golf. If you look on a golf, when they, uh, when they play golf, they have something called a tee. You know what a tee is? To hold the ball. Yeah, to hold the ball. They have like a little pin like this to hold the ball. So what they do when they're about to start is they put the tee in the ground and then they put the golf ball on the tee. 
So the golf ball is like, it's there. It's a nice sunny day. It's right in the middle of the green grass. And now it's sitting nicely on the tee. And the golf ball thinks, wow, everything is great. Life is good. I'm here basking in the sun. I'm surrounded by greenery and wonderful scenery. And then at one point the person comes and just goes, boom. One hit, <laughs> golf ball is just knocked out of this place. This is basically material life. Everyone is thinking it's nice, it's great. I'm living the dream. This is like a famous saying in England. Living the dream. They have it, they have like a car with tinted windows and a big sound system, and then they have a Sign, living the dream, I'm living the dream. But every dream comes to an end. That's material life. So here, Pallad is saying, don't try for material happiness and distress, because this is all down to karma, it will come and go. Yeah, go beyond this, go for something much higher, go for something much more significant. And therefore in the Gita, in so many verses, Krishna is saying the same thing. Matraspara says to Kauntaya, Sitoshna, Sukha Dukada, tolerate happiness and distress. Then later on he says to Arjun, Sukha Dukhe Same Kritva, Labha Labho Jayo Jayo. In Sukha, in Dukha, Same Kritva, be the same. Then later on he again says to Arjun, Dukeshva Anudvigna Manaha, Shukeshu Vigatas Praha. One who is able to be the same in great happiness and even great distress is called the Stitadhir Muniruchate, one who is a sage of the steady mind. So one must become like this, equal in both happiness and distress. Because this is the nature of life, it will come. It will come. Happiness and distress, there is no avoiding it. So therefore, here what's coming out is that material happiness and distress is fixed. To some extent we may be able to increase or decrease a little bit here and there, but for the most part, we shouldn't make so many big plans to try to achieve material happiness. The, that, if you look at society, that's basically what's happening. People are making so many big plans to try to increase their material happiness. <coughs> it's useless. Completely useless. One time Prabhupada was walking and then there was a children's playground. So then he stopped. And he looked at all the devotees, the children were playing. So Prabhupada, he pointed with his cane and he said, children's playground. And then all the devotees looked and they were looking at the children playing on the swings, playing on the roundabout, you know, all the different. And then Prabhupada turned round to the other side and he pointed his cane towards the city where there were big skyscrapers and so many things. And Prabhupada said, adults' playground. This is the children's playground, and this is the adults' playground. <laughs> they think they're so much more advanced, they think they're so much more intelligent, but actually it's just a playground. In other words, there's no substance there. There's no real substance of happiness to be found there. One time again, Prabhupada, as we know, he was doing morning walks every day. So one time when he was in Australia, uh, because in Australia everything is so far, so then in order to get to the park, they had to drive there in the morning. So they drove Prabhupada in the car at 6 o'clock in the morning towards the park, so that he could do his morning walk. And as they got onto the motorway, there was a huge traffic jam. So Prabhupada was sitting in the back of the seat of the car and he said to the devotee, it's six o'clock in the morning. How is it possible there's a traffic jam at six o'clock in the morning? 
So the devotee said, Prabhupada, in Australia, because everything is so far away, people, they have to leave their homes at sometimes 5.30 in the morning because they have to drive two hours to work. And then they go to work and then they drive two hours back. And as soon as Prabhupada heard it, the devotee was looking at Prabhupada and one tear fell from Prabhupada's eyes. And he said, they're working so hard, but for what? They're working so hard, but for what? They're working hard, making all this money, endeavoring so much. And then during the whole time, they have no time to even enjoy any of that, because they're always working so hard. Prabhupada would go and walk in the parks and no one would be in the park, beautiful park. And Prabhupada would say, see they're working so hard <laughs> to maintain the park, plant the flowers, engage the you know, gardeners to cut the grass and here we are enjoying the whole thing. They can't even enjoy it. So Prabhupada said the whole situation of the material world is actually crazy, crazy situation. People are trying so much, but there's nothing to be found. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think... And most people know that material happiness is limited, actually. Like, if you go on book distribution, and you say this to people, that, you know, anything, material happiness you get is very limited. We're trying to introduce you to a higher happiness. So when you say this to people, that material things don't make you happy, you know, most people can agree with that. Yeah, if you would say on Sankirtan to people, material things don't make you happy. You know, sometimes you stop someone on Sankirtan and they have like six carrier bags of things here, six carrier bags of things here, and then I look at them and I say, you know, material things don't make you happy. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I agree, I really agree. And then I'm looking at them and thinking, my God, they agree, but everyone's still doing it. And why do you think that is? Why do you think people still engage in material pursuits for happiness, even though many of them know that it doesn't actually bring happiness yet? Well, one thing is that they don't know a positive alternative. Mm. They don't know a positive alternative, very good. There's also this, uh, the Yudhisthira Maharaj said that the most amazing thing is that everybody knows that they're going to die. Yeah. But still they, it's like they know it. They but block it out. Yeah, like that way. That even though they know going in this, yeah, yeah. the shops and the ladies and that, they say they know that they actually want love. But they only know how to give their bodies. Yeah, yeah so they don't... So the same point actually is coming out. That the only reason people keep doing material things for happiness, even when inside of them they know it doesn't bring happiness, is because they don't have anything else. You know, if you have a bird in a cage for many, many years, and then you open the door to the cage, the bird will fly out into the freedom of the world and then oftentimes, you know what the bird will do? Fly back into the cage. Because although there's so much opportunity here, it doesn't know how to do it or how to utilize the opportunity. So it get, goes back to the safe place that it knows. Because that's all it knows. You know, sometimes someone has been in prison for 10 years, 20 years, and then after 20 years they tell them, okay, you're free. And then the person walks out of prison. And you know, many times, in many, many cases, what prisoners do, they commit a crime on purpose and make sure they get caught on purpose by the police just so that they can go back to jail. Because jail is all they know now. This happens. This reoffending. It happens all the time. People actually want to go back to jail. 
especially nowadays, the jail is actually quite nice. You can play on like video games. And you get everything you need. A bird will be set free, but a bird comes back into the cage. A prisoner is set free from prison, but comes back into the prison because that's all they know. Uh, even sometimes you see, like we have one devotee who comes to the temple, he's a mechanic. So it's like it's a really passionate job. Morning to evening, just work, work, work. He's got like six mobile phones. Whenever I go to see him to repair a temple vehicle, he's always having like three conversations in one go. It's like totally passionate job. So now he's like 60 years old, nearly. So I said to him, like, okay, bro, you know, like, you've done your bit in the world. Now just relax. Leave your job and just engage yourself in Krishna consciousness. And he tried it for one week. And he just said, my mind is going crazy, you know, like I just need to go back to work. Because his mind is just wired in such a way that he has to function like that. The point I'm making is that people cannot leave material happiness. I'm not saying he's living with material happiness, I'm just giving an example that people cannot leave material happiness because they don't know anything else. And therefore, only when people are given a positive alternative can they actually uh, give up this endeavor to try to be happy materially. And therefore, this is explained by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita again. Vishaya vinivartante nirahara siddhinam raso varjam raso pyasya param prisva nivartate. Krishna says that one may be restricted from sense enjoyment, but the taste, the inclination, the desire, the search for material things still remains. Raso varjam raso pyasya. But when one gives up these material plans for happiness by experiencing the Param Dristva, the higher taste, then one is fixed in consciousness. So only when one actually takes up the positive alternative of spiritual life, spiritual happiness, can one actually achieve this state where they're not trying to look for so many material things. And therefore, as devotees, we have to not only teach this to the world, we don't have to go out there only on the street and teach people real happiness lies in spiritual life, but we also have to be experiencing it ourselves. We have to be experiencing it ourselves. That's the real evidence. That's the real uh, proof. You have to be experiencing it. Like when the Panchatattva, uh, when Nimai came back from Gaya and became intoxicated with the holy name of Krishna and he came back to Navadvip, then he said that he got together with all the Panchatattva. And then he said, Patra Patra Vichar Nahi Nahi Stana Stana. Je jane paaye tane kare prema dhan Lutiya khaiya diya bandara ujale Ascharya bandara prema shataguna bale They went to the house of Sri Thakur and what did they do? First, Lutiya they broke open the storehouse of love of God then once the storehouse had been broken open what did they do? Khaiya they tasted it for themselves. They relished it. They experienced it. They felt it. And then naturally, dia. Then they gave it to the whole world. So we have to show people not only by our words, but by our own life, that actually Krishna consciousness is the highest happiness. Higher and more substantial than any type of material arrangement and we have to actually show that. 
But the truth is, we're here in spiritual life and we're not experiencing, maybe, every day, this spiritual happiness. So why is that? Why is our practice of Krishna consciousness not bringing us the spiritual happiness that it should? In the Bhagavatam it's explained, Savepam Shamparo Dharmo Yado Bhakti Yado Sujay Ahayuki Aprati Hata Yayatma Suprasidati That devotional service only when it has two qualities will completely satisfy the self. In order for devotional service to bring us complete happiness which satisfies the self, the devotional service must have two qualities. Anyone know what those qualities are, as mentioned in this verse? Unmotivated and unmotivated. Exactly. So if we look at our life and our practice of devotional service, and we question, is my practice of devotional service, number one, uninterrupted? And then we ask ourselves, is my devotional service unmotivated, no agenda? If any answer of no is coming in those two questions, then we can understand to that extent we are blocked from experiencing the spiritual happiness that we feel. First thing is that devotional service should be uninterrupted, steady, always uh, regulated. Not that some days very good, some days very weak, then there's no opportunity to build up the momentum. And at the same time, devotional service has to be unmotivated. No agenda, no desires, no uh, plans for my own glorification or success in devotional life, but simply out of genuine service attitude towards Krishna and the Vaishnavas. Then as we develop our uh, devotional service in these two areas of devotional service being uninterrupted and unmotivated, then as we develop in that way, then Yayatma Supersidhi then it becomes actually fulfilling. So a very, very powerful statement here is being made by Pallad. He says that actually, however, one is happy as long as one does not endeavour for happiness. This is a very, very simple line, but it's so profound, so profound. One actually becomes happy when you stop looking for happiness. We tell people you find yourself by forgetting about yourself. When you lose yourself in devotional service for Krishna, then in that absorption in service you actually find the greatest treasure. But as long as we're not absorbed in devotions, as long as we're absorbed in ourselves, then we will never find um, the actual happiness that we're looking for. And therefore, these are some thoughts. So it's 8.40. I guess we stop at 8.45, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe a few minutes if anyone has any questions or comments, corrections. Yeah, I just had an experience that because of just about everything you said in the lecture today because uh, before Rajyatra there is so much things to do and just going here and there and picking up some little book and whatever. And um, so I was feeling quite uh, uh, satisfied with being engaged. But then I was thinking today uh, in the morning that oh, tomorrow is Rajyatra, then I will dance and I will be like this and that. <laughs> and immediately I yeah, so I just experienced that. So yeah, then you came to Bhagavatam class and then you <laughs> set them set their mind straight again. Now I'm feeling again happy. Yeah. It's actually a very, very subtle and very, very powerful point in spiritual life that because we're so conditioned in material life to think that we're working for something in the future. 
material life is kind of like it, it programs you to think like that. That I'm doing now something for which in the future I'll get some benefit. But spiritual life is not like that. It's said that there's sadhya, there's the practice, uh, sorry, there's the perfection, and there's sadhana, which is the practice. But it's said in spiritual life that there's no difference between the sadhana and the sadhya. So that the thing that you're practicing at the moment is not so that you will get something in the future, but if you actually put your consciousness into it now, you will experience it now. So we're not doing devotional service so that we'll experience something in the future. Real devotional service is experiencing it in the now. In the service now. Like you're doing the service for Rathi Yatra, as he said, not so that on Rathi Yatra day it will be so amazing, but the service itself now is the perfection. You're completely in the right place in your spiritual life, right here and now. And if we live in that present moment, I mean, even self-development gurus talk about it, the power of now. Living in the now. The <coughs> emotional service is living, living in the now. So, yeah, for sure. Yes. Um, one thing which is very much in relation to this verse, which I personally find a little hard to like, to do like nicely balanced way. It's like when we, for example, we go on book distribution and we have to maintain the body. And sometimes you do exactly this, that you try to minimize the distress in order to do the service. Um, so could you talk a little about that and how to actually like, yeah, see it as a service maintenance? Yes. Yeah. So this is a very good point that here it's said in the verse that um, everyone is trying to achieve happiness and at the same time diminish his distress. But one could also say that as devotees, are we not also trying to do this? We try to diminish our distress. If you have a cut on your foot, then you deal with it, right? You do something. Just like your friend, the acupuncture friend is coming, and he's giving you so much treatment to diminish your distress in your body. So then, are you, Gorni Thai Prabhu, also uh, guilty of doing the same thing as the materialists, trying to diminish their distress? Are you? No. Because your desire to diminish your distress is so that you can increase your service to Krishna. A materialist desire to diminish their distress is because they think in that very act of diminishing their distress, their quality of life will increase. But you understand that not simply by diminishing your distress will you be happy, but that the diminishing of your distress gives you the opportunity to render service which will make you happy. So you have that added element that you know that it's just giving me the opportunity of having a healthy body so I can engage in service. The service is the real thing. So therefore, the problem is not that we diminish our distress. But the problem is when we think that that very act is going to change the quality of my life. Then you're in illusion. Because if you diminish one type of distress, you'll just get another type of distress. And then when you diminish that distress, you'll get another type of distress. So therefore, Prabhupada said the real thing is, create a nice situation so that you can do devotional service. And by devotional service, that's the ultimate way by which you'll destroy distress, isn't it? What's the first characteristic that Rupa Goswami gives of devotional service in the next of devotion? What's the first of the six characteristics of devotional service?